Good morning. Thank you for joining us today live from the Rawlings Library for a special program, How the West Was Won for Suffrage. As you may know, the year 2020 marks the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, guaranteeing and protecting women's constitutional right to vote. This historic centennial offers an opportunity to commemorate a milestone of democracy and to explore its relevance to the issues of equal rights today. East versus West, who contributed the most to women's suffrage in America? Yes, they helped each other to get the vote, but which got there first and why? Historical fact disguised as a competition presented by a biased Westerner. Today's program is presented by Kathy De Herrera, a retired teacher and administrator, history enthusiast, and volunteer at the Pueblo Heritage Museum since 2007. We will have a short um, five minute introductory presentation right now, and then we will have it followed by our feature presentation. So please enjoy. This marvelous little book does contain outrageous pronouncements by men on the natural inferiority I've included some here to give you a sense of the prevailing thinking about what women were like down through the centuries and across the world and why men have been hiding behind for so long.
Thank you all. I hope you enjoyed that introductory slideshow. Um, that one did not have audio, so just if you thought you missed anything, um, that was just some text to get us started. So now for our feature presentation, um, there will be audio on all of the slides. Enjoy this next one. Welcome to How the West Was Won for Women's Suffrage. As I began to learn about the suffrage movement, I saw it developing differently in the western part of the U.S. as opposed to the east. And I began to frame it in, as kind of a competition. I put my name on the western side of the world because that is where my rights definitely is. And I decided to make it a com competition but on who contributed the most to suffrage and to suffrage by looking at which milestone that brought us closer to suffrage and seeing where it took place. Most of my family came out of the milestone of the first feminist in North America. That happened in the United States. Lana de la Cruz was born in a small town near Mexico City in 1650. Why? I'm claiming her for the West, and that may be a bit of a stretch, but she's very worthwhile to have on our side. From this point on, we'll be awarding points to states as the locations of milestones. And this next milestone is the first woman to ask for the vote in the year 1648. And in this case, the point goes to the east for the tiny state of Maryland shown in red on this map. The woman in this case is Margaret French. As a single woman, she put all the property in her own name in Maryland. Margaret had went into the business of her husband and lived the process of selling the vegetables to her sister and mother. Still acting as 
the executor for the governor, Margaret Brent appeared before the Maryland Assembly in January of 1648 and asked them to give her a vote so that she could act on his behalf. When they refused, she got permission to pay by selling the cattle that belonged to Lord Baltimore, burning his wrath, but ensuring the peace of the public. She was appointed as the first woman in the to demand her brother's vote. Our next Milestone is the first state where women actually got to vote. This distinction belongs to New Jersey, where for over 30 years, beginning in 1776, New Jersey granted the right to vote to all the inhabitants, which included widows, This wider application of voter rights may have been due to the influence of the Quakers, who were a significant political force in the colony. In the Quaker religion, women had considerably more respect and rights than they did elsewhere. One politician is quoted as saying, Our daughters are the same relation to us as our sons. We owe them the same duty. They are The next milestone we will examine is the best boot camp for women to learn how to be politically active. And that was, boot camp was the abolition movement, which involved most of the northern states along the eastern seaboard. Ladies at that time were not party government or organizations. They did not call or chair meetings or speak in public. The few who did were led by their passion to end slavery. They learned to organize, speak out, and take the criticism and abuse of others to the brain. They also started to notice that there were some similarities in their status and that of slaves. The next milestone is the first group to organize for women's rights and the vote. And yet again, this goes to the east, to Seneca Falls in western New York. These two women attended an international abolitionist conference in London. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was a young married woman who went with her husband, the two of them both delegates, and Lucretia Watt was one of the most well-recognized abolitionists in America. At the meeting, they found that women were controversial. The first time they had spent the day in the parliament meeting to be treated, and it ended up with them being separated from the new body of the women. Let's say to the declaration of 
Elizabeth and Lucretia were incensed at this treatment. And a few years later, they met for a tea party. Just like all the ruined kids and stars. Uh, they were in a hospital bed with a black woman who were there, discussed what had happened, and decided to have a cruel attack. The ladies put ads in local papers. And over 300 people came, both men and women, and discussed the lack of educational opportunities and the economic and social injustices that women experienced. They put together a document called the Declaration of Sentiments, which was modeled So you can see our milestones are falling heavily on the eastern side. Let's see if we do better with the first speaking tours and the first national organization for women's rights. Women formed state and national organizations. They spread the word with speaking tours and by giving lectures. They approached lawmakers asking for change. And they testified in some and national legislative Let's do a short recap here. The East has the first demands for the vote. It has the leaders. It has organization and some years of experience that have to Our situation in the West is different. We have our single learned philosopher is our one hopefully her legacy is influencing the women in the southwest we have a focus on survival this is population density that means we need to create more citizens in order to promote biodiversity Our next milestone is the first state where women win the vote. And finally, a victory in the West, Wyoming, where women win the vote as Wyoming territory is formed. Here's where one of the advantages of sparse population comes into play. In Wyoming, women had to convince less than 20 men to get suffrage for women into the Constitution and the territory. It passed in both houses by a total vote of 12 to 1 in 6 years. It was signed into law by Thank you.
Utah Territory passed a woman suffrage bill in 1870, and women voted for a number of years. Congress was uncomfortable with the Mormon polygamy and blocked suffrage in 1887. Some other states that tried Wyoming gained statehood in 1890 and earned its nickname of the Equality State. Women's suffrage was in the proposed state constitution, and Congress debated for six months about whether to include them or not. Trying to convince them to remove the women's suffrage, it said that one Wyoming lawmaker claimed that Wyoming. Now up for grabs is the milestone where women convince a whole state full of men to vote for women's suffrage. And the state to achieve that milestone is our very own favorite state, Colorado, in 1893. During territorial times in 1868 and 1870, there were attempts by two governors, Evans and McCook, to insert women's suffrage into the state constitution. Both failed. At the Constitutional Convention, which would make Colorado a state in 1870, the the was Colorado's new constitution was approved in 1876 and it became the centennial state. The first general assembly put women's suffrage on the ballot for 1877. Important nationally known suffragists like Lucy Stone and Susan B. Anthony came and campaigned in Colorado. The measure was opposed by religious like the Archbishop of Denver who called suffragists disappointed old maids. The measure was defeated by a two to one margin. In 1890, Denver women brought new life to Colorado suffrage. They created a new organization and began with a war chest of $25. Elizabeth Ensley was the treasurer and helped get financial backing. She also rallied the African American community to support suffrage. Carolyn Nichols Churchill was editor of The Queen Bee, a periodical on women's rights and suffrage. Minnie Reynolds, a Rocky Mountain News reporter, convinced 75% of Colorado newspapers to endorse suffrage. Ellis Meredith, an editor of the Rocky Mountain News, went to the Chicago World's Fair to ask help from national suffrage leaders. They sent Carrie Catt, an organizer who later became the 
national president of the suffrage movement. Governor Waite had been on board from the beginning and endorsed suffrage in his inauguration speech. Colorado suffragists worked with quiet determination and careful organization. They worked through the Women's Christian Temperance Union, through women's clubs and churches throughout the state. They produced and distributed 150,000 leaflets and were endorsed by many politicians. The portrait you see is Emma Ghent Curtis. She was a poet, novelist, and the editor of a weekly publication in Canyon City, where she was a local suffragist and also worked at the state and national levels. The bottom left picture shows some Colorado Springs suffragists at a rally by the Garden of the Gods. The opponents of suffrage were really taken by surprise and only were able to muster a few minutes. And it was a solid victory for women's suffrage, winning more than 54% of the vote. And that led to other milestones for Colorado. In 1894, the voters went to the polls and elected the first three female state legislators in the United States and perhaps in the world. On the left is the clear Carrie Clyde Pollard from Pilgrim, and the other two ladies from Denver are Claire Jessica and Francis Clark. In 1896, Utah and Idaho joined Wyoming and Colorado to make four states where women could have equal voting rights with men. And this was commemorated in Idaho's white age music. A four star flag and then they assumed by the Ended up being the last victory for 14 years. They persisted through losses in California, South Dakota, Washington, and other states. In this time, it must have been fun to be from one of these four states. At all the national conventions and gatherings, the representatives from the lonely Western states got to be front and center, and their expertise was asked, and many, many women from Colorado and the United States would help in their campaigns. Finally, in 1910, the log jam was broken. Washington won big after several previous defeats. This time, they changed their tactics. Less In 1911, California tried an entirely different kind of campaigning with a vibrant, modern approach. They used parades and rallies. They had 10,000 workers. They put out positive messages for more than 3 million pieces of literature. Some of it in five different languages. They had electric signs, grocery bags, advertising suffrage. They sold 50,000 pins, and they had help from Gail Wampler, the Colorado women in the Huron State. They won by only 35 total votes and almost 200,000. It made San Francisco the largest suffrage state in the world, and California the most populated suffrage state. After the win in California, the opposition to suffrage became more concerned. It was well-funded and well-organized. It came basically from three sources. Businesses, especially the liquor industry, which is the frame of women banning 
the family. The Antis were sometimes by wealthy Protestant Republican women from urban areas. Even though the West is surging ahead with states winning suffrage, the East has an advantage in the money department. There are plenty of wealthy women in the East to are contributing heavily to the suffrage cause. Others, uh, tremendous sums of money and, and sometimes funded their headquarters. Pauline Agassi Shaw and Margaret Molly by then was working and living on the East Coast and And in 1912, we have a head to head campaign. Three states in the West brought into a vote, and three states in Kansas, which quite a lot of And when the results were in, Kansas won 175,000 to 159,000 and became the seventh suffrage state. Arizona won by a 2 to 1 margin, carrying every county in the state. Oregon won on its sixth try, 61,000 to 57,000. Sadly, none of the eastern states had a win. Now, more than ever, the western states were viewed as a resource for the other suffragists. They sent women to other states to speak. They inspired others to follow suit. Um, and you can see the kind of advertising other states used wanting to join the suffrage group. Suffragists loved maps, and this was a popular one. It looks like suffrage is just steamrolling across the country, but in fact, except for California, most of these states represented everything to the left and little influence in the actual southern states. This was the anti's answer to the suffrage map. They have created a sort of chart here with a person in a dark color out in the form which is not This is the map that shows the gains in 1914. Montana and Nevada have been added as well as the Alaska Territory. And now the West is solidly pro suffrage. And in that year, five other states lost their gains. Here we see the map for 1919. Five years later, see how agonizingly slow this state-by-state state tactic is. 
However, despite the needs having a lens start, reasons seem to be related to low population density. Some states wanted to attract women to their areas. Some needed more voters for more power and the ability to qualify for statehood. In these smaller states, there were fewer legislators and voters to convince to make a change. And the city of women led them to network together and have stronger bonds and more built-in resources in working together. Other reasons may have been related to politics itself. The younger politicians in the West were perhaps more flexible thinking. Once Some reasons seem to be related to the basic nature of the people and the reasons they came to the West. Pioneers might have been more independent and more willing to take risks than others. Women were civilizing the religious creatures. Men and women were on the more than the And women were put some of these accomplishments in perspective, it's interesting to look back at 1893. The gold stars on the map show us the only places in the world in 1893 where women were on equal weight with men. The start of the bottom of the map was the first country to grant women suffrage. And finally, in Kathy, um, we just wanted to give a big shout out to Kathy D. Herrera um, for putting together this presentation um, and volunteering her time to do this on behalf of the library. So thank you. Um, all of you, I hope you enjoyed today's presentation. Um, don't forget, we still have a few more weeks left of summer reading. So um, feel free to still sign up and watch our Facebook page, um, our library um, website. We have a ton of events still going on virtually um, for the rest of the summer. So I hope you all have a great rest of your day and thank you for joining us.